Meet Varsha Pilbrow, biological anthropologist at the University of Melbourne. Now, she is an expert in ape dentition. So here's a scoring system for ape dentition. And her PhD thesis was this, dental variation in African apes with implications for understanding patterns of variation in species of fossil apes. And we talked about the shape of the human skull and the shape of the chimpanzee skull and how we humans uh, are different from some of the other apes. What is your name? Varshaw Pilbra. Varshaw Pilbra. And what do you do? I teach anatomy, uh -huh. and I do research in human evolution. Ah, okay. What kind of research? Um, I mostly look at the dentition of apes, and I try to work out patterns of variation within species of apes, mm -hmm. because I'm interested in the question of what a species is in the paleontological context. What's the most important thing about human evolution that students should know? Well, I think that the most important thing that they probably ought to know is that we are quite unique in quite a few things that we do. So the fact that we stand on two legs is a very unique thing. And but understanding that uniqueness of humans uh, can only be understood from a context where we look at our evolutionary relatives. So we really need to understand chimpanzees to be able to understand humans better. Now, one thing that I've been told is that humans have a chin. Could you pick oh, up? Yeah. Now, so my question is, what, what's the purpose of a chin? What, why do we have a chin? Um, what's the, so good? Let me hold it up next to your chin, please. Yes. Okay. A little bit closer, a little bit closer. So what's the purpose of our chins? I mean, that's really a very important question because chins are one character that define modern humans. Some people have said, well, you know, when we, when our face got pushed back in, um, it just so happens that, you know, with that, and the face got pushed back in because now we're not oh, focusing so much on our chewing muscles. So instead of having prognaceous jaw, it yeah, came back in, and then the in, chin didn't go and back then as far. the chin didn't go, but that doesn't make sense. Why would the chin not go back <laughs> so far? Right, right. And the interesting thing is, if you actually were to cut that in half, Yes. And you want to take a look at it, you'll notice that down there at the bit of the chin, yes. that's where there's a lot of cortical bone. Cortical bone? Yes, so okay. that's really thick bone. Okay. That's important. Warm. And that's why, you know, this, the saying in the past was take it on your take chin. Take it on the chin. Yeah, I sort of, there's two different kind of ideas about, you know, the chin. One is sort of a just so thing where it's called, you know, a spandrel hypothesis, mm -hmm. where, you know, it's a morphology that follows on from something else. So what were the so, things that it followed from then? So some of the things are that there's a big, the, these are the attachment wait, 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 sites where? right there. Where? Just a, right, can just a second, let me get in focus. There's attachment sites. For the tongue. Oh. Yep. And okay. so because we do a lot of... Tongue wagging. <laughs> yep, tongue wagging. And so we need to have a big tongue, and that then allows us that, that cortical bone is really important as an attachment site oh. for the tongue. It turns out that I don't like that idea too much because it turns out that we don't do any more movements of the tongue than animals that don't use their tongue in quite the same way. So mm. the idea was that we speak and so we use our tongue and therefore we have a chin. I don't think that really adds up. The other idea is that, you know, this having that chin there mm -hmm. stops that kind of wish boning. Wish boning when you're chewing? Yep, when you're chewing. Oh. And so the tendency would be for these two parts of the jaw to split apart. Oh. And that the chin then provides the buttressing. Oh, it's a flying buttress. Yep. I <laughs> see, okay. Um, and I don't know whether that that is a good idea either. So honestly, of all the things, and then of course, you know, there are people who say that that's a, a sexually selected trait because that is, you know, a square um, jaw with a prominent chin is meant to be attractive in males. Do you find that attractive, a oh, prominent jaw? That, yes, well, a lot of people will look at that and say, and of course you can take a look at someone who has a chin. Well, how about you personally? Uh, yes, I think so. You like men with prominent jaws. I would imagine, yeah. Does your husband have a prominent jaw? <laughs> So, yeah. You hope so. <laughs> you didn't choose him for that character? No, it wasn't no. just that, yeah. Like maybe you chose him for his brain size? Yes, yeah. <laughs> so you were responsible for making Homo sapiens have larger brains because you yeah. chose a man with a larger brain. Yeah. You rejected men with smaller brains. Yes. <laughs> Do you, is, are you serious about that? Uh, I don't know. I mean, I, I can't. I'll have to think back again. Okay. So okay. I <laughs> All right. Uh, so... For students who are looking at the evolution of humans for the past, I don't know, 10 million years or so, 
What do you think that they should remember about who they are when they look at this history? Well, I think it should it should give them the sense that uh, you know the aspects about their humanness that they think of as being unique has really has got a really long history, and the only way and this is interesting for us because we teach students who are going to be doctors and they're going to be in the medical profession. Yes, and it's and while we focus a lot on you know helping people in their health it's probably important for us to understand that many of these um, ailments that we have can probably be helped by looking at that evolutionary history and that's what I try to make them understand. The doctors? Yeah, the would-be doctors. Yeah. 